by episode, storyline by storyline, character by character, as we break down the making of your favorite zip code, with your host, <laughs> Charles Rose. Did I say that? Yeah. Harry oh, Mullen. This heinous thing about the, the, the real person, and we go, what? We're getting rid of this guy. Pete Ferrero. I'm feeling wonderful. <laughs> Kathleen <laughs> looks crush, TV crush worthy. Like so many special guests. And all your questions, live on the Beverly Hills 90210 Show. Oh, yeah. There's a dance now. God, I love everybody dance now. It's my favorite part. Feel, it gets me up. I feel yeah. energized. <laughs> um, hey, Charles and Larry, we're back on another week of the Beverly Hills 90210 Show. Hey, I got to tell you, man, Charles, I... Larry and I watched this earlier this week, the episode we're going to cover, and I think it's some of your finest stuff that you've you've done on 90210. And right off the bat, I wanted to let you know that. So um, we're, we're going to dive into Thank this. Thank you for saying that. I thought so, too. I, I mean, I remember, you know, it all came back, and there's a lot lots to be proud of there. Um, and, and a lot, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it in a different – I don't want to be a downer, but it seems so – much more innocent than the hate that we have today. Chuck, I felt we had gone backwards in a way because you know we, this this episode shows that you can you can you can not succumb to cancel culture. You can find a positive solution that's inclusive. Absolutely. And so Absolutely. we've gone downhill since then. I mean, we, it's all now knee jerk. We don't get the well, other side canceled, where I'm going to bear they, witness, which is they the end of the show. They wouldn't let me run another show, Larry. I, you know. <laughs> I know. I mean, they it's a conspiracy. Us. Conspiracy. Like, we were cancel culture. Yeah, <laughs> I, I want. By the way, I got the. I checked the ratings out for this. If uh, just let me see. If, well, you guys thought for a second. I'm gonna pull it right up. Okay. Well, oh, I was yeah, curious. I was curious of the ratings. I'm glad you got it. Yeah. I but, found Larry, it, yeah. I do need to ask you about this at the top of the show here. Uh, What's that? Huh? What states do we? Okay. Need? I have it. I have it. We need to get this. America's zip code, fellow friends, and, and October okay, so, sixth is America's. Now, zip code. Washington D.C. Come on. I mean, I know it, there's people, fans in, in Washington D.C. who watch our show. So right. we got to have someone step up. You need to be represent the, uh, you know, the nation's I heard capital. That, I heard that Mitch McConnell's a big fan. <laughs> I would go for him. I, look, I, I'll tell you something. Who is a fan is Bill Clinton, who you know, who I know from college, and uh, and who also let us uh, shoot, the, you know, the Rose Garden stuff. Let us uh, anyway. Let me explain what we're doing here. On October sixth, we're going to have a big show called America Zip Code, where fans are going to represent the state and tell us what it was like watching nine hundred two one zero in your respective state. That's the the premise of this. Coming up, what, what got you hooked? What got you hooked? What was it for, for me? It was Claire Arnold, but that's uh, nobody asked me. <laughs> but, um, so so now we, we're inviting everybody, and we have what six states? Uh, I've got it at uh, six, yeah. So it's DC, which we should get, Iowa, which is South, South Dakota, you know, I mean, okay, that Montana, Nebraska, and Mississippi. Now, I think we can get Miss, and then we also yeah, have get New Mexico. I got nothing in New Mexico. That guy didn't come. Did someone else commit from Utah? Oh, I, think I have Utah on the We're going to have oh. to do a full court press on that, Pete. Okay. Well, so we don't have, yeah, I was going to say we also have to do that with, uh, I told Jennifer Sterla, if you're listening, Jennifer, if she can't deliver somebody, then she's going to have to be the person, even though That's she didn't said. grow up watching there, but she was a production assistant on the show and she's I'm, Hawaiian. I might Hawaiian. have, I might have DC. I might have DC. So I have a friend. Whose yeah. wife watched 90210 yeah. that lived in DC. So I might yeah. have DC. Mean we don't really have one for Hawaii yet. Is that why you mentioned? Well, we don't have a, a fan other than our Jennifer Sterla, you know. So no, we don't. And well, we don't okay. have yeah, Jennifer Miss, Sterla Mississippi. I believe Mississippi, Diana Lowe might be able to cover two states because she's lived around. By the way, this, so is of, <laughs> this is how all of our Zoom meetings go before the. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever we're planning something, it's very similar. So now we just gave you some. In we basically okay. just caught up, and everything. Well, anyway, we have to we have to find these fans. I'm going to go into gear of this weekend if I if we don't have some more action. All right, I'm going to be stalking stalking the uh, the Facebook groups. If you're from South Dakota, you know those kind of a. I think what we need to do is I'm going to ask um, one of our 90210 alum to put this out and help us insert the, the six states. Uh, you know. 
All right, let's do this ad that's very old, and then we'll come back with the full with the full group. Okay, okay, okay. Do you know we have even more new shirts and merchandise at Beverly Hills 90210 showshop.com? For instance, watch our Planet 90210 show with some sick Planet 90210 merch. Or want to celebrate at the Peach Pit? Check out this new shirt with a photo from Jill Henkel's collection. Or, oh my God, I know Claire Arnold fans are going to love this one. A little sex, rock, and really decent literature. Plus, for all you Larry Mullen fans, that's right, a get out of here shirt. And don't forget about our classic designs. We keep loading it up with more items each week, so head over to Beverly Hills, 90210showshop.com for all your 90210 stuff. Okay, so we have our full group as we're talking about hate is just a four-letter word. Um, I am going to say hello to Natalie first, who, of course, was Janice. May have had a little crush on Janice, too. So... <laughs> <laughs> Chuck, you too. Hi. No, you. Oh, definitely. <laughs> you're, uh, you're, you're a little echoey, Petey. It's you who is the echo. It's me? No, is it's it me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, well, maybe I can lower myself down. Is that helping better? Yes. It is me. Yes. Yes. Sir. Okay. All right. Uh, let's um, let's also introduce John Keane, who is uh, who was Noah Levy in the episode. Um, let's. I always like to start with you, Chuck. Um, this episode obviously started with you. I saw that you have the, the writing credit, the teleplay, everything. I, I love this episode. I just want to talk about it, but Pete, I do want to talk about it with you know that that great steam yard clarity. And yeah, so, uh, we gotta figure this out. Stuff. I'm hearing voices. All right, yeah. let's see. You know, you know, I'm not quite schizophrenic yet. I'm, is it? I'm is it? There. I think it might be Natalie. Is it Natalie? Is it yes. better now? It yes. is. Better. It's Natalie. So it's Natalie, I think you as best is if you just uh, turn your volume down on your speaker, maybe. Okay. Hey. There is we that go. better? Yes. Yeah, I think so. That's better. Yes. Well. Okay. Great. Go ahead, Chuck. So. Uh, well, so um, <laughs> you know, again, you know, there wasn't. We're now in season five. We're a serialized television show. And we don't have um, that many uh, what you would call a stand opportunities for a standalone episode. Even if we were moving other stories forward and and, and dealing with them uh, in some of the B and C storylines, and there were very little opportunities to do social drama. And I had read, and John, I know you were talking about uh, Penn, uh, Go Quakers. Two of my kids went to school there. And um, uh, but but I, I and I and I kept looking to find a Columbia University because I remember it was Columbia invited someone, but it wasn't a professor. It was the Griff from Public Enemy is the one that's on cue at 1990. And he had said some and, and he's what caused Public Enemy actually to break up. He was had had some you know, but I'll just have to call it what it is, some anti-Semitic tendencies and voice them and uh, and Columbia invited him. And the rest of the plot could have come out of just what Natalie and John did. Is it whose money is it? Who said it? Is this the right can you put it off campus? So all of that was there. And um, and look, uh, as as a lifelong liberal, there was nothing more depressing to me to see the. Uh, the split in what had been a very strong progressive coalition for so many years. And it had to do with so many different things. Um, and, and rather than, you know, we don't have to ever do a history lesson here, but, the, but the, the coalition was frayed and needed to have, you know, I felt, why did it have to be? Let's examine these cultures. Let's examine how they, they, they can interact. And, and then, we funneled everything into the 19 and the 90210 prison, and uh, there you go. Yes, I want to ask Natalie, you had been doing a lot of stuff with 90210 when college came around. Um, let's just start with that. What was your experience like getting on to this show, and then we'll forward to this episode? My experience getting onto the show, I I, I was very lucky. Um, I basically 
yeah, just about almost just graduated college. Um, Where'd you go? Where'd you go? <laughs> Carnegie Mellon. Oh, nice. nice. Pittsburgh and a great drama department. Yeah, a very famous drama department. Yes, yes. Bosco. And um, I, and I was, I was working. I did um, Fresh Prince. I did Martin. I, I just kept doing all these things and they just kept sending me so I was going I honestly was like I was there on tour with once on this island they sent me on an audition I got it and they kept sending me and I was like I need to go back <laughs> to New York <laughs> because I need to do theater <laughs> um, I was one of those <laughs> um, and they sent me on the now I was watching the show in college um, but when they sent me on the audition, um, I was like, oh my God, because it was actually a show I was watching. Right. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to screw this up because you know how that goes. That's always what happens. Right. Um, but I didn't. <laughs> I you didn't. didn't. No. no, I didn't. Um, and it's one of the first times um, my my mom and family actually heard me screaming in excitement because everything else I was like, yeah, I got that. It's nice. I want to go back to New York and do theater. <laughs> um, but I was very excited and I got there and everybody was so nice. Jason was so nice. He was so nice. They were all very warm and inviting and I, I couldn't, you know, I was, ex I had some really bad experiences before with um, some of the other cast members on other shows. But I mean, it was, I it was like, I was waiting for them to say, okay, you're part of the regular cast now, but that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't happen. I, had a, I had an amazing time and I was happy with the script and what it was about, that it was about like something like good, you know? So it was it was great. I was very excited. I was excited about the whole thing. <laughs> I mean, I want to ask you too, obviously, I know fans want me to ask you this, and I sort of alluded to this before we came on. It seemed like every time we saw Janice, we saw Alex Diaz. He's not gonna pop up. I do wish he was. I wish I have, I have, I have made contact with Alex Diaz and we're gonna try to get him on a future episode. But I was asking you before we came. Yeah, on. I've heard you say that before. I've heard you say that same line before. We're trying. <laughs> he's, he's off. He's off somewhere else now, and he's coming back from a road trip, so he can't make it today. Okay. But so I was asking you before we came on: Is that a weird thing that like people kind of know you guys as this like pair, but you haven't seen him in quite a long time? I haven't seen him since then. I haven't seen him since then. And right, right. yeah, and then I was answering that it's I'm used to whatever the person is has seen me in. That's how they refer to me. Like I was telling you guys, some people just call me Gary Coleman. That's how they <laughs> shout at me out in the street. <laughs> um, so yeah, it depends. Or, oh, you're that girl that stole Carl Carlson's virginity. Or it's, you know, it depends on what, nice. what they're familiar with. Yeah. Right. Um, the then whole, I, wanna, I should say. <laughs> talk to, to John. John, you had a question for Charles. Oh, yes, Charles. Charles. So, so it, you know, it's a story like Natalie talks about her casting experience. She went up one time for 90210 and booked the job. I had been up for numerous jobs on 90210, and I had ex fully expected to play Andrea's boyfriend in like the 10 arc thing. It became a recurring character, multiple seasons, and I didn't get it after feeling I did. And I told my manager, I'm no longer auditioning for 90210. I feel I've, I've had my chance there. I'm not doing 90210. I get a call. Charles Rosen wrote this part for you. He wants you to come in and just read it, but he's going to give you the job. He wrote this for you. So I guess my question is, did you really write this for me? And what made you think you, you look at me and say, Noah Levy? <laughs> what? So was this my wait to hear the, Larry and I can't wait to hear the answer to that. <laughs> well, well, two things. Um, three things. One is, is that you know, oftentimes we, we really had an, ab an abundance of, of riches coming in for lead roles in our, especially fourth and fifth years, and, and probably afterwards with you, Larry, you know, once the show got a, you know, a, a, a bigger 
profile, people, you know, really fine actors like you both would come in, where in years one and two, it was a little more of a, of, of a challenge. So I, I do know that the actor who played uh, the boyfriend, um, you know, he, he was very good, and he, but he got phased out. Matthew so, Peretta. He was a villain. And it, yeah, he turns into bed. You know, anybody who, you know, you, 902 and 0, you're long enough, you're a guest cast, it isn't going to work out well for you. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to say that uh, I was going to make a joke, especially here at, at the end of, uh, as we have sunset and the end of Rosh Hashanah on, near, on New Year, um, that you look really good in a yarmulke. And that was, you know, I, I, I could tell that it would be perfect. Um, Charles, I, I still own the vest. I still own that blue vest. Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, yeah. Amazing. You, was it I yours think... or did you uh, walk away? It was mine. I bought it at a little... The thrift store in Venice in '92, and it was my lucky vest. And okay. now it's and, been and, there. You go. And we we've, we've had uh, the, our wardrobe um, uh, supervisor Molly Campbell uh, on on many times here, and um, and she has always said about how when actors brought in their own clothes, she almost always went with it uh, mm -hmm. because uh, there was a natural quality to it, and um, we would get paid more that way. So it was a it was a win win. Oh, I didn't even know that. Yeah, you know, we got a little more money if we used our own wardrobe. Oh, All good. right, Charles. It's now, it's it's obvious obvious that Chuck, is avoiding, Chuck is avoiding the, the big question. There. <laughs> Chuck, yeah. Chuck, did you, did you what, what a great manager. We're trying to understand, what, who was your manager, John? My, my manager is a lovely woman named Yvette Schumer. I, I think she, with yes. my admiration for her is going up for that story. But, Chuck, would you want to answer the question? Did your you admiration should go up for Diane Young. Oh, who no, would that's do true. anything or say anything to to convince someone to come in and and He's right. didn't want to. That's correct. We go to Diane. So I I can't say that I did this. In fact, the truth is with this episode, um, although I had a, you know, I could have maybe taken a story credit on it too. Uh, the fact is is that someone else, really Richard Gollins, the the dear departed, worked it up. You know, the script got it to a certain point. Um, so he's the one who dealt with your character and he was the original one. So you'd have to, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to give credit to Diane Young. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a great thing to get. We try to find Diane and Les Landa. We shouldn't forget directed this episode. And I think looking at it again, you know, tip of the, the, the cap to, to Les, it's really well done. Really well done. Yeah. Um, Big extra yes. cast. Would like to just share this, that Rebecca shares this. Natalie is gorgeous. This is so oh, exciting. Thank you. Oh. Um, <laughs> so the episode starts off with a bang, right? We 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 see um, Roland Turner, the person that uh, is, you know, coming to speak. Larry and I did interview the actor who played Roland Turner. I'm going to show that a little bit later. Um, but I guess my question is, um, I don't know. For 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 Natalie, you looked back on this episode. You know, all these years later, uh, what are what are some of your thoughts on some of the things that are the, the topics that are being come? Because I feel like this is one of the bigger episodes that you get to be a part of. This is really a, a meaty, heavy thing. It's not you just sort of arguing with Brandon somewhere. This is you're arguing with Brandon, but it's about something substantive. Right. So the question is exactly. No, what are you? What is your thoughts when you looked back on it and and sort of revisited some of the, the things? Um, that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Really, it's uh, what the entire show. Uh, when I watched it yesterday, I was like, "What?" And here we are. Yeah, still right, um, right, yeah. <laughs> um, which is sad <laughs> really mm -hmm. and it's gotten worse yes um, I mean, no, or maybe well, it's, just... gotten, it's gotten more wicked i mean obviously this wouldn't have come to a thing he just would have been stopped it, would, it wouldn't have become an issue it, the, it would have been a very short conversation you, you know what what was interesting and, and um in the scene where you were so um where both of you were in such a wonderful scene where uh how we kind of started out with yeah, like, I'm, so, I'm going to be right back, honey. <laughs> I'll open the door. Be right back. Yeah. Girlfriend and go a football game and be very yeah. uh, thinking it's just going to be hitting the gavel, very yeah. perfunctory, and um, and then you're there and and all yeah, hell seems to be breaking yeah. loose. But when we pick up the scene, 
and the whole student council is there. Only one guy uh, who, who, who's lambasting Brandon, take the vote, take the vote. Except for that guy, everybody is so respectful. Yes. And today, you'd just be shouted down. Or e even if you'd be in the same room, it, which would be a miracle to get them in uh, mm -hmm. to some extent. Uh, I think the polarization, because, you know, when I, when I said to you that I, I wanted to check out what college it was, was it Penn or was it Columbia? I looked up, I, w I went back to Columbia and I said, uh, anti-Semitic, uh, anti-Semitism, Columbia University in the 1990s. And, and what came up, was yes about the uh, the guy from Public Enemy, but at the same time, oh, the anti-Semitic problem they've had in 2012, in 2015, in 2017, in 2000, it just went on and on. Whether it was and 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 of course, you know what I what this story was, which I, which I like a little bit more, is that it was it was a profoundly American story. Here's a guy he's coming in. It's an American school in this. Today, so much of the uh, anger that fuels identity politics in college campuses has to do with Israel and Palestine oh, and, and, and divestment and other kinds of issues, which I know you probably follow a little bit, John. Yeah, I was going to say, Charles, I think the big, the big difference right now, and by the way, I was at Penn graduating in 89, which is when Louis Farrakhan came and spoke. So to oh, me, wow. when I saw this script, oh, this is Farrakhan. Right. The difference to me, and I've spent the past 20 years in Holocaust education and documentary film, in 1994, you didn't have to equivocate that Nazis were bad. You see not, no Nazi symbolism, it's bad. But after, after Charlottesville, Jews will not replace us, um, we started equivocating over Nazis. It was no longer, this was an absolute evil. It was like, yeah, well, but you did this. And now we got into the world. Yeah. We're in a world now where... Anti there's no longer a, a black and white on certain things. And there should be. Nazis should be bad. There shouldn't be like, yeah, but. And I think in 94, we didn't have to make that case. And now we do, mm. which is bad. I, I would agree with everything you just said. Uh, you know, the, the um, as a Jewish man, it was shocking when Charlottesville and that Friday night. And our friend, Jessica Klein used to live in Charlottesville and was actually uh, in um, uh, Hillel that night on campus where for a service. She's, she's pretty observant. And, um, and they walked by. That's where the, where the procession walked by. And they all had to be locked down in there. They turned off all the lights and heard people walking by going, Jews will not replace us. Yeah. I think it had a profound impact on her uh and and um she and told me at that moment she was scared shitless if i could just say about natalie though i watching the episode again like i'm watching myself and the character i played i thought i was more nuanced at the time no, i'm like oh, I'm really radical on that and i look at natalie i'm like that's who i want to be yeah. i want to be natalie i want to be the person yeah. that can look at this and say I disagree with everything you stand for, but I'm willing to stand here with you and hear what you have to say until you cross that line. So it's like, I think her character to me really stood out watching it again. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna ask you your thoughts on that, Natalie. No, I, I, that's one of the things I, I loved about it. Um, I am that person in reality. And sometimes it pisses some of my friends off. <laughs> um, but I am that person in reality. How do you fix anything? Really, how do you fix it unless somebody feels like they are heard and understood? And even if you're angry, I should you we should be able to talk about that. I have friends that I we don't agree uh, on much. <laughs> we don't agree on much. But we're excellent friends um, because while we piss each other off, we're able to talk to each other and, you know, explain why. And we understand where the other is coming from. I still don't agree with you, but I hear you. You know, I, I, I personally don't understand why 
I feel like most people should be that way. And I know there are no shoulds, but I don't understand how people aren't. Like, what is it that stops you from wanting to get where the other person is coming from? And I understand that's it's my natural instinct, but it's still confusing to me. You know what I mean? That it takes so much energy to just be mad. Well, it's more it's hate. It's it's so, a, it goes yeah. down to hate. Hate but is a four so letter word. Yeah, so. it, but it's so much energy. Like it's so much. Um I had a very good friend, my husband. I had to break up with him. He was too many things because he was always angry. A husband is a gay husband. I see you all looking confused. I, I, <laughs> you know something, Natalie? Evan and Q had a big effect on you. Didn't it? I mean, it really did. If you got a husband, but, but anyway, we'll get into. Ad, I want to get into Evan and Q in a bit. Oh, but, okay. Yeah. yeah. No, go ahead. Oh, I no, no, I don't want to interrupt the floor. Okay, but anyway, he was he was always he was the type that would call and complain, and then the next week he's calling and complaining, and again I'm I'm usually always there. So two three in the morning I'm picking up the phone. Oh, you've gotten stabbed. You're arrested. <laughs> you need bail money. But that's not it. He's calling to complain about the same thing and mm -hmm. the same thing and the same thing. You know what I mean? And I don't know. P people get stuck. I think that's really what it is. I think people get stuck and everybody's always right <laughs> and nobody wants to. That, that's, what it is, no. that's what it is. We now live in a binary world where we no longer can disagree. It's either you agree with me or you're an idiot. Mm -hmm. Zero oh, you're sum. An idiot. It's all zero sum. No. Mm -hmm. I'm going to bring our buddy Drew Kinney into this. Hi, Drew. Howdy, Drew. Howdy, Drew. Howdy, howdy. Hello, hi. I gotta show Drew my shirt before we go. Drew, I wore this one for you because I know you like me are right. great dad. Nice. I wore this one for your daughter, Fish. Oh yeah. Oh, she just went to she was just went to fish shows. Yeah. Uh, I wore it was her. Her. They had two shows. Yeah. <laughs> Drew <laughs> did um a lot of the art or most of the art on 90210, and we were talking off uh, on Facebook about there are some scenes here where you, the swastikas are on the walls at either Occidental or some other location. Sorry, Pete, it was the VA, and I'd love to hear Drew talk about this. Yeah. We were walking around the VA in West LA, and I'm seeing all these guys, these older guys with who have shell shock and everything else. I'm like, they're walking around looking at swastikas. Oh, <laughs> what are they thinking? So like, did, a couple absolutely. things on that. Was, was there a thought to do it on... Occidental, of course, is where CU was. Was there a thought to do it there? And then how did you pivot to another location kind of a thing? And what was that like? To, did you draw the swastikas? Larry said you probably drew the swastikas. <laughs> uh, I, I actually, I, I did them on the drawing. I actually looked. I, somewhere I have the drawing of the elevation of the Interfaith Center with the graffiti and stuff on it. Um, but I couldn't find it. I, I'll find it later and I'll, I'll show it to you at another point. Um, we, we, you know, we originally scouted Occidental and they didn't want to have anything to do with it. No, that's what it was. That's what I remember. Because they were just like, no, this is the, the students are going to freak out over this and we can't do this to them. And it was all, it was all couched on. We can't do this to the students. Nothing else. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't, it was, you know, potentially offensive. It was students were going to be bothered by it. And that was, the yeah. Problem. Well, it sounds like Occidental was like 30 years ahead of its time. Now you've got a college campus that things you don't want to. The minute, well, we shouldn't talk about this. So this professor has said this. So it's it's it, it's hurt me, my my psyche, and and one of my daughters is very uh, susceptible to all of that. Uh, yeah, that, that feeling of the safe space. Yeah, but Occidental was a precursor of that. I forgot that I thought we were on Occidental. I, I did. I did too. I remember Occidental. Yeah. Occidental. Yeah, no, and we ended up at um, we ended up at the VA because they had a bunch of buildings that were unoccupied. And, you know, it was that point where the VA in, in West L.A., there was a bunch of empty spaces. Right. And if you went onto the campus, which you didn't go there unless you had a purpose to be there. And it was it, it was a horrible sight to see these vets who were just spiraling down and kind of left in these horrible conditions. Because we did a bunch of interior stuff there as well, too. And I remember kind of really? just running into them and you know, trying to have conversations with people and you can tell that, you know, things just were not there. 
And so when we actually went out, you know, we scouted it uh, to do the tech scout. And then a bunch of guys showed up because of the tech scout and they got really upset. And they were saying, you know, you can't you can't do this. It's going to be horrible. And, you know, we, and we talked to him about the fact that we'd been investigating like different kinds of paint that we could clean up easily that wouldn't leave marks so that when we walked away, nobody would know that we'd done it. Um, and, it and none of it worked. So basically, we, you know, spot painted some places, then painted graffiti and then spot painted them back out again. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was it was a song and dance trying to get people to say, yeah, we should do it because we said, look, the story's important enough. It's not. It's not that you know we want to graffiti the place because we're trying to sell this message of hate. It's exactly the opposite. Yeah, and that, that was a big. Pro also. It was a big production then. I mean, it, yeah. in yeah. terms of, it looked to me, uh, Pete, you got that that. I got to see them, or the or at least to the me exactly like Occidental. Yeah, yeah, and, and and you say we did interiors there too, because you, know? you guys would have Janet, uh, Natalie, and John would have been there too, because that that means that uh, uh, Gabrielle, I mean Andrea and her grandmother with uh, with Janice were walking up the stairs. Oh no, oh that no, he wasn't speaking at the interface center. That's right, it, it wasn't a big group there. No. Um, yeah, so, good job. Yeah, you guys did a great job with that. I thought. Um, and you know there is the as the thing that's going on with um, just mentioning um, Andrea and her grandmother, and I love the way Charles that you um, wrote Andrea's uh, grandmother back into this. You know we haven't seen her in a few years, and fans have noted that it's a different grandmother, <laughs> right? So uh, yeah, changing well, grandma. If you Lainey Kazan is a grandmother for one show. <laughs> And, we, and she was great in that show, but you know, right. to get her to come back, we got this wonderful woman. Um, and she's still working. That wonderful woman, best. By the uh, way, that, that wonderful yeah. woman, best Meisler, and I yeah. had the same manager. So she's still working, John. They want you, best. Well, so clearly, Beth wanted to work with you, uh, Beth. You know. And, yeah. Um, but anyway, there's some really beautiful stuff that Gabrielle gets to do in this. That's where I was kind of going with this. Um, uh, John, I know you got to do some a, a lot with uh, Gabrielle, and so did you, Natalie. But asking John first, working with Gabrielle on some of this stuff, what, what was that like? I, I have to tell you, I still st tell stories. By the, by the way, I have to say this. B being on 90210, I, I've worked 10 years as an actor, 20 years as a writer-director. 90210 is the single most important credit that people want to talk about it is not everybody wants to talk about 902 when i talk about it i always talk about gabrielle she was i knew jason socially I, I met some of the other people but gabrielle could not have been lovelier and more welcoming because when you come into a show as a guest star you're that, that's a family and you're the new kid at school and gabrielle was the one who showed me around and and, and, and took care of me and it was wonderful to like she was legit it was wonderful to work with her and it's funny that this episode launches her political career on 90210, and then she became president of Screen Actors Guild. Right. Like, you guys were predicting everything on this episode. Yes. <laughs> the Simpsons in 90210, predicting the future. Well, it was, I think that's one of the things about, before Janice talks about Gabby, it was one of the things about it. This was a decidingly political uh, episode. Jason's, Brandon's whole political future is writing on it. Right, um, you pay off Natalie, you're 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 the rep of the BSU, and and one of the things I think that made it so successful for you to have a different tone than Alex Diaz. Alex Diaz wanted to over embarrass Brandon. You wanted to service your organization, so it was two different, completely different ways of looking at it. But politics is that is that um, uh, complicated, that broad, and so we, we, you know we had it on and all of that. And, um, you know, we all, when, when Andrea had already earlier this season, when Brandon was running with the slate of vice, to be vice president and then becomes president after an accident to the um, Josh Richland, who, who dies after being elected, you know, Andrea's feeling bad because she doesn't have the, in the middle of the political tumult. Right. That she never, so this was the episode that gave her a chance to do it. And the, and the two people you mentioned, Beth, um, you know, she has that wonderful line is that you have to go there and bear witness, which is basically, Natalie, what you were with Janice was offering. Come on, we'll sit together yeah, was I mean, the opportunity to do it. But but she was able to use language to interpret it a different a different way. So that was one. And I also think that 
you know, that Jesse, you know, again, and I'm sorry, uh, uh, you know, he couldn't join us tonight, but uh, just looking back, every moment he does is is just right on target. And and uh, Mark Damon Espinosa, and and him saying to her, "I love you. You're a wonderful person, and you're this this, but you're not tolerant." And I can understand that. It, it I was very political, uh, and um, just a, a very short digression. Uh, I was in Cal in the Capitol, uh, Berkeley's program to go to Washington, D.C., and we were at a big table, and my boss uh, in the office I worked for, a, a congresswoman, a newly elected congresswoman named Yvonne Brathwaite Burke, who became a county supervisor here in L.A. for many, many years, um, we were sitting going around the table, and one of the guys who's sitting there was a former professor at Berkeley who, it turns, was working in the Nixon White House. Hmm. And I flipped out. How can you work for that guy? How can you do that? Right. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And as my boss said afterwards, the next day, shaming me rightfully, how do you know he's the one person that's keeping everybody on, on, on track? You know, how the one person who's resisting all the evil there. And that was, and that's kind of who he was. He was one of those original Californians. Right. And, and it's just that, that, uh, you know, you get so caught up in something that you don't really realize there's another side to it. Mm. And, and I, so I got to learn that pretty early on. And uh, with the exception of Iraq, I, I probably held to it. I lost friends over the invasion of Iraq. That for sure. mm. I was pissed off that mm. anybody supported that. Uh, Natalie, just to, to shift here, working with uh, Gabrielle. Um, there's nothing else I can, <laughs> I can say he said at all. I didn't get to spend that much time with her. Um, I spent most of it with Jason, actually, Brandon. Um, but she, like I said, they were all, they were all, they were all absolutely wonderful. They really were. I mean, I can't. One one of the casts that there was no bad attitude from anyone, <laughs> anyone anywhere. You know, um, yeah. Really nice work to um, the two of you have. I think there's some really powerful stuff with you. And and I loved you know when we watched it in the watch along. I was Larry and I were talking about. Um, the the actress who uh, is the in, doing the seventeen magazine uh, cover with, uh, mm -hmm. with with Kelly uh, Larry did you want to talk about her and well, well I I know it meant a lot to Chuck and to, and to myself because she gets to voice what Chuck was uh, talking to before that you know during when we kind of were young men and are trying to make sense of the world the you know the civil rights movement of the late fifties and into the sixties. That was always a, a, the, the African Americans and Jews together. You know, the Jewish. You know, they they you know all the Freedom Rider stuff. Everyone came down for that, and so we had we had lost that sense. Of, well, you know, just that that alliance that Chuck had talked about had broken up, and so she got to voice that as as, as a character. A lot of that, but then she also got to voice the fact that uh, everywhere in the world, you know, she's just viewed for for her you know for, for for what she does and for what she what she, what she you know, is in the world and in america she always has to be reminded of the color of her skin so that, i thought you know she had one scene but i thought she just really killed it i wish we could find this gal uh, to talk to her and tell her how much uh, we admired what she did yeah she was really great in this um and you know there's a lot of other things 90210 ish happening it's ray's birthday so there's there, that's happening and so and, and then the david subplot which before we move on the well david, david was, the most important. Was, a very important that was the most important one for me to do was david yeah. and, and again this um, was a great look, the fact the fact was involved that, in it the fact is is that it, and it, you know in the, the jewish community is is a is a wide and on one side you have the orthodox the other side you have secular they're Jewish because they like pastrami and uh, and they know a handful of Yiddish words. And I have friends like that. You do, too, John. And, and I know. And, uh, and and yet. And so so that idea that I'm you know, the first brush off that that David Silver does, I'm not into politics or it doesn't affect me. And and in that and what how that scene is ended is. Um, well, you know, is 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 the, the impact it has on, you know, Andrea and and the split over that. 
being enough to make him come back and, cons- and and her wrath, which wasn't over the top, but just you could see the, I can't believe it, and was, you know, not happy. You know, he has to reconsider his position. And I think that was what I, I think I was trying to say and do a lot in this particular episode is people reconsidering where they were, you know, in the in how we played Noah Levy in the beginning. You guys would have run, you know, like, let's go in and disrupt him. And, you know, you know, you were in the uh, you would have been of that ilk, perhaps, um, you know, if, if it was an, if it was a true hard Nazi in there. You certainly would have. But well, did you did you plant the bomb? Did you plant the fake bomb scare? Who did the bomb scare? <laughs> right. Come on, yeah, yeah, no, the, the, the statue of limitation is over. You can tell us. <laughs> I, I got to tell you, Charles, this is this is really interesting because could a lot was happening around this episode that I don't think you were aware of. Let's remember, the list was 1993. The Shoah Foundation was created on the heels of that in '94, where they filmed 53,000 Holocaust survivor interviews. This was a time where we were finally embracing the idea of bystander versus upstander. And that's that David arc that you're talking about. When do we stand up for something and when do we stay silent? There was so much happening in our society right now. And I doubt you were all working together, but this is part of that awakening. That well, happened. I was very aware of the Shoah um, mm. document, you know, uh, interviews, because the main person who did it, uh, when I lived in Carthay Circle, Larry lived two dark doors from me. He was a young man, and uh, mm-hmm. my friend Bob Wunsch got him the job with Steven Spielberg, and he started uh, Bob Wunsch. just doing and and uh, yeah, all of us shalom, and uh, and and um, you know, so so I, I I was aware of that, and of course Schindler's List. I'd never seen anything like Schindler's List. I mean, I still believe it's that is the greatest uh, accomplishment Steven Spielberg did as a director. And that's notwithstanding how much I love Close Encounters of the Third Kind. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Melissa has a good question for Chuck and for Chuck and Larry. You guys were talking about this. I was just a kid when this episode originally aired. I would like to know the response this episode received after it aired. Well, I have the ratings. Just curious. Right. Uh, you you did. Right. You know, again, this was a sweep. You know, sweeps month was November. And that's when all the advertising rates are set. And that's kind of like the money ball of, of, of television. So you want to have your most popular episodes then. And so this was a November episode. Now, Dreams of Dylan McKay got 12.8 rating, which is probably about 15 million people. Um, and then this one dropped off to 11.2. And, you know, but still, it, that was, that was uh, you know, 13 oh. million people. So it was, put, put it in perspective, the Dylan McKay episode was 23rd of the week. This episode was 43. Because, again, it wasn't particularly, you know, what our fans maybe wanted to see at the time, you know. They knew Dylan had just cracked his car and was in the hospital, which we have that stuff there. But and I also, the can week, I just bang one, the, okay, one quick week, rant? The Rolling Stones on? What's wrong? I was going to say, you know, the Rolling Stones <laughs> next week episode, just to put it in perspective, you know, I rant about this. It was from it went from 11.2 to an 8.6. And we got shit for it. But it was Wednesday night before Thanksgiving. I kept saying, no one watches the show. That's my... Anyway, this the episode has gone on. But Who this episode did pretty well. And, and obviously... Who gave you shit for that? Nobody gave you shit for that. The network did, yeah. Joe Chuck, they did at the time. They went, how come the ratings were so low for the sweeps? We had we had a down problem. We're going like, it's Wednesday night. All our fans are like driving home from college. There's no like... Oh, because of that one. Well, yes, yeah. anytime, anytime. They, they stopped doing that practice. And this is, Wednesday. you know, whether we, we, so we can't really look at the 90s as this halcyon, you know, period of, of, of you know, racial harmony, because any time we did a show that had, um, with the exception of Home and Away, a football episode that had uh, West Beverly playing uh, an inner city school and there'd be a murder and all sorts of stuff came out. The exception of that one, any time we had race in anything, we, we plummeted. Yes. Mm. And nothing was worse. Well, we didn't care. One I mean. episode we haven't covered yet. The one episode we haven't covered in this show yet is uh, is Ashes to Ashes in the second year where we, we where we created the Black Walsh family. And right. I was and and the both the network and I, we was thought, oh, this is gonna be great. This is gonna be a franchise. It's the lowest rated show we did the whole time I did five years. So yeah. that's just pro yeah, it's our it so it was our audience. But also, it which was Fox. This did pretty well. 
I mean, considering it, it, in a sense, and, and it's obviously it, in, in time, it's really appreciated by the fans. I mean, they see you know the work that's gone on. So what saying. So now, to answer the question that was posed, the one thing I do know is that my uh, my rabbi at Wilshire Boulevard Temple here in Los Angeles was a name Harvey Fields, and uh, his son Joel Fields is uh, does very became a very prominent writer uh, producer and, and did the Americans. And you know, won a deserved Emmy for for much of his work in the Writers Guild Awards, and and Harvey used it to teach the confirmation class for years. Oh, I think great. I think it was a it was a perennial in that. And down in Orange County, they too sh showed it at the Jewish Community Center and had a a, a Q and A on that. But listen, I'm you know, come on, nine hundred two one zero. We've talked about this, and it's one of the reasons that I was so you know, uh, uh, wounded after I left this place because nobody gave us any credit for anything we did. And yeah. I don't say that. It was, wow, so it was just the fact. Nobody was going to say, right. this is an amazing <laughs> breakthrough because they wouldn't be watching 90210. And all I'm going to say to those critics who don't like 90210, try to watch the pilot of Hill Street Blues. It's unwatchable. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. I want to ask you all about this. Um, there is a reference here. That Brandon says, I think he says to Janice, um, next time, invite Bill Cosby. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, yes. The, the most offense, uh, inoffensive African-American. Right. You can think of time. <laughs> like, <laughs> now, that would never happen. Yeah, John, he, was John, America, he was America's dad. That's right. John, he some was. things don't remain the same. Right. <laughs> what did you think of that? Because I didn't know that was coming. I didn't know who he was going to say. I, yeah, I forgot about that when I um, heard it yesterday. I, <laughs> I was like, oh, God. everything clenched up. He would be the most benign name I could come up with. Uh, I, I, you were you were spot on. I mean, yeah. there was no way that you could ever imagine that. Yeah, it's almost funnier now. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, I mean, play it now it's irony. It was a really great <laughs> joke. Perfect. You can invite Roland Turner to a campus easier than you could invite Bill Cosby to a campus. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. That's true. Today, I'm sure. Yep. The other line, just to pick up a random line that I really uh, was, I, I don't remember writing, but I went, well, that was a pretty good one, CR. It was um, when Brandon is walking away from the reporter and says, uh -huh. you know, why don't you go chase a fire or something? something. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and I, as someone who used to be in the, a reporter, you know, I, I'm, you know, reporters go after the story and mm -hmm. really don't care sometimes of the, you know, social repercussions uh, of anything. They just want to get the quote and get the ratings. Um, and that was Jillian Barbary, the the reporter in. Uh, yes, she was. Yeah. She came in to read for us. Yeah. She, yeah. she was involved in those years with KTTV, which That's right. was the local Fox affiliate. Uh, and um, yes, and she came in and, and she read. She came all the way, schlepped all the way out to Oxnard and Kessner and, you know, read. read she was read really nice. For us. She was really, really nice. You know, really well, that was such a, that, those jobs was a, such a gift to a on-air talent. You know, mm -hmm. you don't have to do too much. You play a reporter, you know, yeah. it, it, you know, a lot of them would come in, uh, you know, to, to want to be involved with our shows. Yeah, yeah. Uh, those jobs were a gift to all of us. That was, a, honestly, like, I mean, Natalie said it, that was, that was a wonderful cast and crew to work with. That was one of the nicest places you could walk into, honestly. I'm not saying that because I'm here talking to you. I'm happy yeah, no. to talk to you. Shows I did that made me like lose the will to live, you know. That I was there, that's the nicest guys in Hollywood. I'm like, you absolutely not. 902 and 0 was, was, a, was a great was coming great. experience for any young actor. It was great, yeah. Well, Charles, thanks for writing the role for me. I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> well, Drew knows, you know, come on, Drew is sitting here, and Drew is, is really somebody who, uh, uh, you know, is it represents all of that. You know, there was really no lines between, I mean, there were lines and different things that sometimes had to happen, particularly with us as producers dealing with our cast, but not too much, uh, you know, with, 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 you know, the cat, with the crew and, and the, and the product and, uh, and the executives. 
and the cast. Cast was close to these guys right from the start because we were so isolated up to the valley. But then it just was, who do we like to, to be with? And, you know, and it used to be, and you could tell this is so different from other shows. You know, when they, when you had, when they serve lunch at a, at a table and, and, you know, our, and, and people sit down, they, the actors sit here, the camera department sits here, the art department sits here. That wasn't the way it was. It was all mingled. You know, and I and I really look forward to my conversations, interactions with Drew and his and his partner, uh, Tom Dicker. You know, they were my my good. I, you know, uh, and and so that was uh, that was just serendipity. I don't know why. Why it was so nice. I think everybody was just so happy to be this. This little show works. So we're working. So let's go, you know. Right. And, uh, and and we were doing 32 episodes. So everybody was happy because they're getting paid more. Drew, also the you know most of the crew. I mean, you know, I was literally just a couple of years older than the a couple of years older than the actors, and so there was a bunch of us on the crew. They're about the same age, so you know oh, we yeah. were all idealistic, and for most of us, like you know, it was our first real thing we'd done out in the world, and so we, we all bonded together, and just you know, it was the greatest place in the world to work. It really was. I well, we, we started as a as a non-union show for the first two years. Yep. And when we changed over, and our, our producer, Paul Wagner, basically said to everybody as the vote was coming down, please realize you're going to open up the whole book and we can get other people to come in here. Yep. <laughs> Your jobs won't be guaranteed. And it was going to be, except for the art department and the wardrobe department and casting, it was going to be pretty much a clean sweep. <laughs> And the uh, actors would not let Eric Lopez, who was uh, one of the gaffers, be fired. No, no, he's got to come back. He was the only one, and he was he because what did he do on weekends? He played golf with Jason. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Yeah. That's Jason what Standen. I want to. Um, sh we have like this five minute interview we did with France Turner. I'm going to play that now. Um, he was Roland Turner. We invited him on the show. <laughs> so I know it was a big deal back in 90210, but we did ask him and uh, here are some of his thoughts. Hello. Hi. <laughs> here we have France Turner. Uh, yes. What's up, man? How are you? This is well. He's Roland Turner to everybody who's who, who's watching. Well, yeah, for Roland it's, Turner. It's amazing yeah. how uh, how you know we had cancel culture so far ahead of this thing. I mean, really, uh, it's hilarious. You know, this is the same thing that's happening now. <laughs> that's uh, that was uh, Roland Turner's problem. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you didn't get typecast. No, it was uh, it was very interesting thing. You know, back at that time. Before I auditioned for the role, uh, I was wondering, should I be doing this? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> People think I am this. You know, it's like when you play Manson, you never get hired again. You know, you're, you know, you're Manson. Manson. <laughs> it's kind of like, uh, you know, I said, this is Hollywood. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's, it's true. I'm going to get on national TV and rail about the Jewish people. <laughs> I know. I know. It's got to get taken out of context. France, what was this experience like for you? You said you barely remembered things 25 years ago, but you remember this. I Well, I remember this because it was a good part. It, it was a good part. It was, no, it was, uh, it opened the show and it opened the show kind of fiery. Yes. And, um, and when I was thinking about it, you know, I, interesting enough, I asked my mother, <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about this? She said, it's a role, do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I thought a lot about about uh, Roland Turner, you know, and auditioning for it, and it was just like, go for it, go for it. The man's angry. The man's angry. Yes, and he's yeah, start up here. Yeah, yeah. He's angry, and he's angry. He's angry about the situation, about conditions, but he, he's also angry because he doesn't know what to do about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I I kind of get lost when I'm doing that. You know, I went in and. You know, I belted it out. <laughs> and I said, well, I was honest. <laughs> and, uh, and that was it. I was very happy to get that call. And then when I, I thought that the the script is as fiery as that little outburst was, that it was written by white guys. 
It was very simple. I think I remember that um, we shot it in the morning, and um, and so we were we were finished by lunchtime. I did stay for lunch though. Uh, <laughs> Do you remember what you had for lunch? Lunch is in my contract. I'm staying. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, no, Pete, I didn't. Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> we always feed the actors. You have to feed the actors. You know? But I remember it was very good. Uh, no, I remember that the set was really cool. Um, the director, Le Les? Les yeah. Lando. Yeah, the director was really good. He said, uh, do you need anything? I said, no. Uh, he said, are you nervous? I said, do I look nervous? <laughs> yeah. <That's great. laughs> I said, of course I am, but that's okay. I said, so is Roland. <laughs> so and so um, I think we shot it a few times. We just shot it a few times. And uh, and it was it was done. Um, I think that Les Light liked it. Um, you know, he kept saying, you know, you can you can heat it up if you want to. And I was going, mm, any more than this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm going to be coming over the podium. <laughs> but I did. So it was um, it was a good day. I really enjoyed um, enjoyed doing that character. Um, and I thought, I said, you know, this is the guy who would be a politician one day. I thought about trying to, uh, what is the solution? Which is, I thought, is what Roland Turner would be thinking about. You know, what do I do? And so what do I do about it? Keep people riled up. Keep people passionate. Keep people, you know, being concerned about history and what was going on. The thing that I I hated was the the counter um, counter Jewish part. <laughs> you know, when I'm just railing on 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 Jewish people, and I said, but that's what Roland Turner would do. He right. would do that. He's shifting blame. <laughs> exactly. So I thought that was a lot of fun to 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 get to talk to uh, France about playing Roland. Very interesting, and I and I do want to say a couple of things about that opening passage. That was written by uh, entirety by um, Richard Gollins. It's the one thing I kept that he did because we both consulted. Uh, you brought up Louis Farrakhan, John. Um, one of our writers, uh, Chip Johannesson, uh, actually went to the sports arena. To do research, I guess, on something. He just he just sat up there and he listened to Farrakhan. You know, he was he said I was one of the few Caucasians in the room, in the arena. But so we used him to to talk about that opening passage and and, and what it should be. I, I wonder if Chip had some influence too on it. What I really liked about the guy though, um, you know, uh, Mr. Turner, how he how he did it was that is that it wasn't so incendiary. It wasn't like Farrakhan screaming. You know, Farrakhan screams, uh, I believe, uh, at least in the tapes. I mean, he didn't He didn't do that. What, what was incendiary was the information he was imparting, not necessarily himself. And my favorite line in the whole sequence to that was, was done by our uh, Deshaun, Cres Williams, who says he's a promoter. Anybody who gets money... Uh, you know, making ten thousand dollars to talk to people to represent poor people uh, is a promoter, and it was a way to just kind of put him out of the topic. It was no longer about Roland Turner, and I think that's that was one of the things that kind of put that argument to bed. It, he wasn't the focus anymore. He just was the guy who was going to be there, and I love the fact. Uh, that, that uh, you know, he put in that, uh, you know, always oh, late. He's always late. I'm learning this, you know, and, and it's, you know, like waiting for Sly and the Family Stone to show up, you know, <laughs> yeah. hours. You know? Yeah. Um, I do love that. I was going to ask you about that, Chuck, about uh, adding Deshaun to the Deshaun to the episode. I think he's. A, I think it's really important that he comes in. He's a he's a character that we all know and we've seen on the show before, and his. I think his voice matters there. So exactly. I thought. I thought it was great that you brought him. I think the next episode, he really, uh, is in, in the whole thing where they're trying to get rid of Brandon, uh, I think Deshaun is, is, is the deciding uh, voice in the thing. He's a, he's a pivotal. He was, a, he was, you know, when you're a star athlete at a small college, you are a star. Yeah. yeah. So For sure. Uh, and for Natalie, what are you up to today? 
Oh, today I'm waiting to hear about something. I don't want to say what and jinx it. Okay. <laughs> you're, wor you're, you're, you're working and you're still... But it is. It. Yes, I am. I am. I am. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of the theater. Theater. You do love your theater, <laughs> as we learned. Uh, and John, how about you? Um, I know you did a documentary about uh, 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 after this, right? Yeah, I, I've been I've been working in documentaries since about 2002, um, doing a lot of stories about how people recover from trauma. I had two films about Holocaust survivors called Swimming in Auschwitz and After Auschwitz, available on Amazon and your other fine vendors. <laughs> it was really how people overcome trauma, which is, which is valuable for everybody. I've been to Rwanda filming there, which again happened six months before the show aired. Rwanda genocide was April of '94. And not a topic in America for a long time. Um, so I, I, I've, been, I've been in that world, and um, look, I, I look back on the, like, I, like I, as actors, we never know what your last job is. So I always tried to say thank you to the people I worked with when the job was over, and just another opportunity to say thank you. This was this was one of those experiences that every I, I, I've been rejected to play myself in a movie, and yet people <laughs> talk about nine hundred two one zero. What a great experience! So. I just think it's a shame that Noah Levy was was expelled from from the college. <laughs> yeah, yeah let me get back. I think it's, it's criminal that he was expelled for the bomb threat. Well, you know, you know what that, I know what that's all about. You know, and you know, why you guys went back. Uh, you asked right. that. Is that uh, Larry can tell you that the day I walked out was the day Aaron Spelling said no campus mm. politics. Yeah. So mm. there was no more time to have the other characters come in and talk about real each substantive issues. I don't think you got much opportunity to do that. You did do social drama, but not put into a political cauldron. Not, yeah, because Brandon was out of the, yeah, we didn't, we didn't have Brandon as a political animal anymore. Brandon went into the, uh, the, the television station, you know, which is different. Gonna say right now, Larry, um, missed opportunity you should have brought janice back later on in season seven when he runs in to uh mariah at the at the library in houston janice would have been way better we ha we, we have familiarity you should have brought janice back it's no awful child oh, to play a second it. character yeah. no uh, <laughs> I don't know. janice I'm is so refined you know i'm just yelling you know we got a girl in texas a little town in texas you know but anyway uh sometimes I mean, you gotta be in your lane Zara says uh, that she loves Nat's vibes, and so do I. All right, so uh, I think we kind of uh, covered this, is, uh, right, Chuck? We, is there anything? Oh, somebody wanted to know real quick about Stephanie Beecham. Oh, this yeah. is the last time that she's uh, on the show. Uh, Chris asked, did you guys know that that would be the last time that Stephanie Beecham would be on 90210? No. <laughs> Absolutely not. Good no, she was just hard to, to 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 hire. Basically, she was a working actress, and and she was the most. Uh, I think I've said this on the show. I've revealed this. She was our most expensive guest star. Yeah, she and so that's why she by the Gersh awesome. agency, and these are guys I grew up with, and that was the only reason we could get her at all because she she had worked for Mr. Spelling uh, on one of his uh, on the Colbys. I think she was involved with that TV show. That mm -hmm. kind of spin-off of Dynasty, as it were. But um, what I really liked about her involvement in this show, I'm glad you brought it up, Pete, is that here was Dylan finally confiding in his mother, yeah. that his mother was the one that uh, got to... Sorry about that. Okay. I'm getting rid of the call. Um, <laughs> his mother was the one that, got to, that he confided with, and he talked about, I saw my dad, and I saw this, and what the dream was. Uh, he, he shared it with one person and that was, you know, the ability to, we, we, you know, get his feelings about it, but that it was to her. And, uh, I thought was, was real interesting. And of course, having John Gry show up again and, and Tiffany knowing to get rid of the look for the drug to get rid of it. If he was doing some, he would be doing more would be there. Um, so I thought that was an, it, we didn't spend almost any time on, on it. On, on Dylan's plot. I mean, screen-wise, it probably was four minutes of that. But it had impact, I think. I think all the little runners did it, as did Kelly, you know. Yeah. She, uh, you know, this was the first step of her being the model and, and uh, all of that. 
and also with Ray, you know, you know, we get introduced to Ray Pruitt yeah. and we start to like Ray here, you know, I mean, no one shows up at his, birthday, birthday, party. To his birthday party. Exactly. You know, we start seeing all the things that, you know, Donna sees in him. And of course the next episode, he's going to play on stage. So with, you know, on the voodoo lounge stage and all that stuff. So there's a lot of nice things being built uh, throughout this entire thing. Go ahead. That was the one scene though. And I'm just thinking at the end there, and, and and I once got criticized, and I think we got criticized, me and, and, and Mr. Spelling on this one, is that, okay, so it was great. We have this character who is a, who's decided to be a virgin and yet dresses as provocatively as she possibly can week after week after week. And if you look at them, what she's wearing and them kissing and the way they're kissing – I mean, okay, there was no, there was, I'm sorry to get so graphic. There was no penetration. Okay. But there had to be everything else. Right. Otherwise it's just, it's just bullshit because that was a lot of fire going on with those two at that moment, the birthday boy. Yes. Um, what do you feel about that, Larry? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, it's everyone's right to wear a dress any way they want to, well, but, I, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> but no, I think we, uh, you know, in a way that's just how, uh, Tori was in real life, I guess, that she felt comfortable dressing that way, and and oh, Don and, 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 it, and it made for it, you know, an enigma of a character in a way. At least she was true to her Catholicism. She was a Catholic girl. Would go to confession. She could honestly say to the priest, "I didn't have sex. Uh, we were dry humping to beat the band, but you know, <laughs> there's nothing going on there." So yeah, I mean, I think it was okay. I, I didn't mind. I, I never. I like you know. I like kissing on the show. So I thought it was wonderful. It was a great kiss. That was a ten, wasn't it, Larry? It was good. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and Claire looked Claire, phenomenal in this. As Claire, well. yeah. You know, we got everyone going. You know, in the good episodes, the the main story, everyone has a has a has a point of view and it, it's reflected on it. And this this really worked well. And it hats off to Les Landau wherever he is. We couldn't find him either. The poor director uh, oh, he was a, a Hollywood kid. I mean, I don't know where he is. All right, guys, we covered this um, next week. We're plotting out a very good episode. It's going to be pre-recorded. We won't be live. It's very exciting, though. It's probably my favorite episode of 90201 one of them, and so it's happening. So I won't say what it is in case it doesn't happen. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know what it is. <laughs> yeah. It's so good to see you, Natalie and John. I'm so thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Thanks thanks all of you. Natalie, I think I'm also, I'm it's so write important. You an email to share I've... my my Vav and UQ story with you. I'm sorry. I'll write you an email to okay. share my Avenue Q story with you. Okay. Uh, you know, okay. <laughs> my, my my son yeah. married a Platt. So really? We were all we were charmed. Okay. Not charmed. We were wicked. Yeah. You know, we were we were all in on wicked. So I want to uh, <laughs> just share okay. these stories with you. Okay. Okay. Yes. Natalie, you Let have to come back on because you've been on you nine hundred two one zero a whole bunch. Uh, sadly, John, I don't know that you'll be a returning contestant on the Beverly Hills Not Two One Zero podcast. It's <laughs> right, <laughs> Natalie. There's a lot of cool things. Maybe one day we can reunite you with Alex and Diaz or FJ. And I, yeah, I, I, honestly, I used to see Alex all the time. In the, really? in the four years after that show, I would see him at auditions, and and I would see him all the time out as we did our our let's find another job thing. Well, I looked at his credit. I mean, I, I always do this before. I go to IMDb of who's coming on and, and what has happened to them and this and, you know, and saw that you were the really interesting documentarian and that you had done Avenue Q, among other things, and really went back to Broadway. On that Tony show, you got to be there. Uh, it was great. Um, but uh, he did all action stuff. He was in Prison Break, and he he did. He, he was did, in he did Prison Blue. Break. He was a cop. He did he did a lot of that. That's where he was. Kind of roles. This was his you know his his foray into into uh, political activism in our show. And he always wore that jean jacket. So <laughs> does he have the blue vest still? Right. I wonder if he still has that jean jacket. <laughs> All right, guys, we will be back next week pre-recorded. A lot of cool things. Make sure you get it. zip code people. Please get your your zip codes to us because we really need that. All right, everybody, have a good one. We were. Bye, everyone. Nice to see you all.